if you're driving around Florida or Georgia and you see pine trees in the mm. lumber industry, that is called Southern yellow pine. And that's Got what it. goes into the trusses, the floor joists, the panels, the, the studs and everything. They do sure. use some spruce pine fir, but just for logistical reasons and freight, they use the Southern yellow pine because that's what's here. And basically, you know, some of the mills, they started having some pl- employees coming down with COVID and they had new policies and they just couldn't be running like they were normally running. Hey, it's my pleasure to welcome another one of our clients for a client case study, and that is Bruce Weyer. It's good to have him here. He's coming to us from uh, northern area of Florida. Uh, So uh, he's in um, Jacksonville Beach right now at his office. And uh, you probably heard me talking about it a couple of months ago. He was the one who uh, was kind enough to send me the insider newsletter that I'm holding up right now. If you happen to be looking at a video version, the Lumber Market Report. This is the random lengths uh, newsletter. And this is kind of the inside of the lumber market. What does that mean for us as investors? Well, of course, you know, it's all about packaged commodities investing, as I call it. And lumber is a huge component of housing prices and housing construction. And uh, so we'll talk about that a little bit as well as his case study and his background. Bruce, welcome. How are you doing? Hey, Jason. Thanks for having me on. It's definitely good to have you. You know, I almost was wondering, uh, I just want to tell the audience if they're watching on video, we did not coordinate our shirt colors. <laughs> <laughs> no, we certainly did not. I did think about that. We're both wearing red shirts by coincidence. Well, hey, let's move on to the lumber business because this obviously affects real estate investors. And I want to talk about your investing uh, experience as well. How long ago did you find my podcast? Probably I was just about to move back to Florida. So this would have been 2016, summer of 2016, maybe fall of 2016. Okay, good stuff. Good stuff. You probably heard me talk about, you know, packaged commodities investing and stuff like that. And when, um, when you sent over this, uh, this fantastic report, uh, just with some inside info on the lumber industry, I mean, it's, Unbelievable. unbelievable what's happening right now. Give us an update on the market and what's going on. It's unbelievable what's been happening. It, it was everything. It was so really cool to see the supply demand shock that you were already talking about from March, but it hadn't hit my industry yet. So we were just kind of chugging along and we're going through this pandemic and uh, everything was going really well. And obviously Florida, the demand is huge. Everything that we do is is Southern yellow pine in the Florida market. And that's all of the specific pine that goes into the um, that, framing the of the houses. Right? Southern yellow pine, it's called. If you're driving around Florida or Georgia and you see pine trees in mm-hmm. the lumber industry, that is called Southern yellow pine. And that's Got what it. goes into the trusses, the floor joists, the panels, the, the studs and everything. They do sure. use some spruce pine fir, but just for logistical reasons and freight, they use the Southern yellow pine because that's what's here. And basically, you know, some of the mills, they started having some pl- employees coming down with COVID and they had new policies and they just couldn't be running like they were normally running. The efficiency wasn't there. So the supply that they were producing was lowered and the demand was through the roof with interest rates being very low and everybody leaving the major metro areas coming to Florida the prices just started to creep at first. And then they just started to really skyrocket to the point where, uh, you know, one of the largest lumber providers is called West Frazier. And they took about five mills completely off the market. I mean, they wouldn't even sell to us. We've been buying lumber from them and paying them within 10 days, taking a discount on every truck that we buy from them for 42 years. And they just went completely off the market. Now they went off the market because they didn't have supply or or they're, uh, they're a mill. So they're producing supply. They are producing supply. They're receiving the logs and then yeah. they're they're milling those into two by fours, two by sixes, two okay. by eights and everything. And the reason so you for that- You wouldn't think that would be like an affected business though. I mean, they could continue to operate during the pandemic, right? Or- I think they had people going down. And the other thing was, is they had oversold their contracts. So instead of renegotiating some of their contracts, well, on people that are buying contract lumber and saying, hey, we're in a pandemic, we need to serve the open market as well as service the contracts. They told anybody that wasn't a contract that, hey, we just can't sell you right now. And then that really, the, the thing about that was, is that that put the pressure on all the other smaller mills that we also deal with that don't have any contracts on with anybody. 
So then those guys just got completely bombarded and um, it really rocked the lumber market. Yeah. So uh, I predicted, and I think we've seen this just a little bit, at least I, I started watching the lumber futures market more closely after reading your newsletter. Um, but uh, that has uh, abated a little bit, right? It's a little better now, right? Because that it's a little getting a little more equal. I mean, it's not equal, but it it's better than it was, right? It's better than it was. They're now starting to quote and starting to ship a little bit more, but still the prices are, you know, so take a two before number two common 16 foot truck, right? People buy those all the time. Normally back pre pandemic, those were probably somewhere in the mid 400s, mid 500 uh, per thousand board feet. They're still up over a thousand dollars per thousand board feet right now. So it's still so double what double. it was. Yes. Double? Double. Okay. Wow. That's amazing. So even now, as things are starting to get a little more semi-normal or they're moving in the normal direction, they're still, it's still double the price. Still twice as much. Wow. No wonder the cost of construction has gone up and the builders have been raising their prices like crazy. Now, um, you know, I talked uh, a lot many years ago during the Great Recession, um, you know, back in 2008, so 12 years ago now, about what I call regression to replacement cost. When a piece of wood costs what a piece of wood is worth again, meaning that, you know, houses were selling below the cost of construction for a short time and that had to fix itself. And regression to replacement cost is not the same thing as appreciation because appreciation mostly takes place in the land value, not in the con construction ingredients or the packaged commodities. And so, um, you know, now we look at the price of this and uh, it's, it's just absolutely crazy. I would assume that's true with many other building materials as well, although I haven't had time to do much research on it. But um, obviously, lumber is a, a giant component. So what do you see happening in the future, Bruce? I think prices are going to continue to hold at this level, especially in the two before market. So the two by sixes have started to decline. They're nowhere near where their price equilibrium was months ago, but they have started to decline some. But the two before market is still holding very steady. I mean, you can't, you call to get a quote on a truck, a random length truck, that's like eight foot through 16 foot. And a lot of mills still won't even quote it. Wow. They don't even have because they just, they just don't have anything to sell. So why give you a quote, right? They don't have it. Wow. And why would there be a difference in two by sixes and two by fours? Any particular reason for that? They're using two by fours a lot more than the two by six. Yeah. Okay. But I would assume so just, this mar market's already set up. So it supplies more two by fours too, right? Because that's kind of the basic ingredient. They do, but certain mills cut for certain dimensions more. Some some mills kind of cut towards the wider lengths more, and that's kind of their wheelhouse. And some length, some mills are cutting for strictly two by fours, and we kind of that's our job is to weave all that together. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Incredible. Incredible. So is there any relief in sight for this or uh, will it just continue to increase? And by the way, let me just hold up this chart. I'm just literally holding it in front of the yeah. camera. Pardon the low tech uh, here, yeah. folks. But, you know, you get it. There is the chart from the newsletter. That's absolutely mind boggling. And, you know, here... Uh, you know, I, I actually read this on the podcast before is the market overview, um, the, the narrative uh, portion. But uh, will anything give us relief from this? Or are we just looking at higher lumber prices uh, for a long time? Well, it's hard to tell. So I was also the guy that sent you the email about David Weekly with the homes going completely off the market. Right. You know, if they just completely stop selling the homes, so everybody's buying, you know, 30 and 90 days out. Well, if we get 90 days from now and you have people and builders like David Weekly or Lennar saying, hey, we're not going to take a new order because they just can't price in the increases fast enough to pass it along to their customer. Well, then the housing starts and the permits issued will all fall and then the demand will fall just because they're not entering in new orders. So that could offset it, but I doubt that's going to happen because, you know, we're in Florida and interest rates are low and people are getting the hell out of all of those towns and coming down here. Right. But you don't just supply to Florida, do you? Yes. We're oh, strictly do. Florida. Yep. For, for, your, for your stuff. So a home builder orders the lumber through you. Are you, are you considered a broker? 
We're wholesalers and we actually don't sell to builders. We sell to trust companies. We sell to distributors. So we're selling Ah. to people that are treating lumber like Great Southern Wood or Boise or um, Robbins Manufacturing. And then those guys are then selling to the builders. So we're- Got it we're literally buying from the mills that are creating the product and okay. you know, cause okay. the, the home builders, they want it in such a specific way that we're not doing that. We're literally buying truckload quantities and we're shipping those to a dis- distribution company or a trust company where then the builder is putting in an order with the trust company for a specific neighborhood or specific home model that they've created. Okay. Makes sense. Makes sense. Well, um, now uh, with your investing, since we've been talking about Florida, because that's the lumber subject, but with your investing, um, I think you uh, you just purchased two uh, properties through a network in Florida and you also purchased two out of state, right? Tell us that's about your, your portfolio. Yep. So I originally started in Dayton, Ohio. And the only reason I, I've been listening to you for a while and I called up Sarah and I said, Hey, I know there's nothing on your website in Dayton, but this is where uh, my wife is from the Cincinnati Dayton area in between there. And I'm a big fan of Tom Wheelwright as well. And he says, Hey, you know, buy somewhere where you can go and use it as a write off and all this other stuff. And I can kind of keep my, it's a uh, arm's length away from me. So I went and bought a duplex in Dayton, Ohio. And that was the first thing that I purchased there. And then I uh, ended up buying a fourplex in Dayton. And then now I have two duplexes under contract in Palm coast. Mm-hmm. Good stuff. And uh, before we started today, uh, you had talked about a bit of a strategy there. So uh, why don't you share that with the listeners? Okay, so part of my strategy is, you know, Jason, what you've taught me a lot is that uh, part of what I'm purchasing or one of the main things I'm trying to obtain is the largest loan size I can at the lowest interest rate for the longest amount of time I possibly can. So, uh, you know, I started off with the duplex because it was really a low number and I was just trying to get my feet wet. And then I moved up to the fourplex. And then now I'm going with the new construction duplexes because I'm trying to get as many doors as I can under the 10 Fannie and Freddie loans that I have with the highest loan amounts. So if I try to go out and buy that single family home for $100,000, well, while I think that's a good deal, really I want those 10 Fannie and Freddie loans to be locked in at the biggest numbers I can, I can handle. Absolutely. Absolutely. So you, uh, you're doing, you're trying to do more of the more expensive properties earlier in the game uh, right. because you want those really good loans. And we call this mortgage sequencing, by the way, we talked about this strategy years ago, but not lately on the show. And, um, and you want to get as many of those in the highest possible loan amounts for that first 10. Now, if your wife is working, you know, she can qualify as well. Uh, so, um, you know, I don't know if she is, but uh, it's 10 loans each spouse. So you're not just yes. limited to 10, you can do 20. Uh, but, you, yes. you know, both parties do have to qualify. So if, if one isn't working, then it's not going to work. So why Palm Coast? Uh, again, that's kind of close to my house. So Palm Coast is only 40 minutes away from me. And I called, I, you know, I called over there and talked to some of the people and I just said, Hey, shoot me straight. You know, I love all your markets. Uh, Everything looks good. I I feel like one of the hardest things for me in choosing all of these is I'm looking at your website, I'm getting kind of Sarah's hot sheet and I'm looking at everything and judging my opportunity cost. I feel like is, is really difficult because I'm like, Hey, I could do this deal here in Alabama. I could do this here over here and I'm not really sure what to do. So really I called them up and I said, Hey, what, what market do you guys really like? And you think has a good chance for appreciation and um, and then after they found out where I live, they said, Hey man, it just makes sense for you to invest right down the street from you, you know? Right, right. But don't be limited by that. Okay. Um, I mean, you've got your wife's hometown <laughs> for some of your investments and then not too far from you. Uh, but, uh, you know, you don't want to be uh, excluded from a good deal because the deal is more important than the location. You know, that's just something you want to keep in mind. Are you going to do a third or fourth or fifth market? You know, we say invest in at least three, but not more than five. Are you going to yeah. put another one on there? Yes, definitely. Um, cash is becoming a little bit of an issue at this point because I just did the two and those were right at about $300,000 a piece. So I got to come up with the down payment for both of those. But um, yeah, I definitely plan on it. You know, I'm going to try to close on both of these Palm Coast in this coming spring. 
And then, uh, no, that was another thing that I was going to mention is the CARES Act. We talked a little bit about that beforehand. So now that I've listened to you for a few years, I'm all chips in, you know, I'm not doing the whole, hey, let me just give money out of my income that I'm creating now into an IRA or 401k and put on a blindfold and hope I wake up in 35 years and it's all good. Right. Uh, I'm just not doing that. So we decided that philosophy. Good. (laughs) Yes, I know. So it's a little bit. Um, it's not really that scary, but I feel like when I talk to my peers about it, they're going, what are you doing? You're, you're listening to some guy on a podcast and now you're liquidating your IRA. And, uh, I'm saying, yeah, that's actually exactly what I'm doing. His name's Jason Hartman. Here's the link to one of these things. And, uh, that's, I'm in. Yeah. Yeah. Good, good deal. So to be specific, what you're talking about there is, are you borrowing money from your IRA, uh, without penalty or uh, what exactly is your your CARES Act strategy there? Or you, you're liquidating because, mm-hmm. you know, Tom, Tom Wilwright and Garrett Sutton, both both of those authors are really just not fans of these plans at all. No, they I'm are not, not as, um, I, I don't hate them as much as they do, but I don't think they're great either. Okay, so I'm, I'm like a little more in the middle than both of them are. Uh, but what, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I I basically agree with Tom Wheelwright, and I feel like we've been fortunate enough. My wife is a registered nurse, and she has been for the last fifteen plus years. And you know, she's getting matched money. She's working for these great companies, and it's been building, and all that's been great. Uh, but now that the CARES Act came along, they said, "Hey, listen, you can take out up to a hundred thousand dollars with no ten percent penalty, and you can also pay the tax on the income from whatever amount you take out." over the course of three years, instead of getting hit in the first year, which that's actually how I paid for that quadplex, you know, and I said, Hey, you know, if we're going to be in a bad situation with this pandemic and everything going on, at least that's a silver lining that's coming out of it. And I'm just going for it. That's great. That's a great deal. You're going to do much better in the properties. I am sure of that if I'm sure of anything. And one other thing that I wanted to talk to you about, or at least mention to you is, you know, you always say that these deals always look better in the rear view mirror, right? So I'm trying to take a macro view on this. And even if I do take a little bit of a hit on getting my money out of these IRAs on the sums that I'm taking out, Jason, once I've had that principal paid down and the appreciation goes up and I have the cash flow coming in, you know, seven, eight, 10, 12 years from now, when I look back, I'm going to say, man, I wish I bought more of those things, right? So I completely agree with you on that philosophy that I've heard you state on the podcast. Mm -hmm. Good, good. I'm glad you like it. Any other questions or thoughts or things you want to share about your own investing plans or experiences? Um, Yes. So you had mentioned sometimes taking, uh, acquiring these properties for as little down as possible. So I've actually been borrowing on the duplex and on the quadplex I own. I borrowed private money and I put down about 10 to 15%. And I held those for a few years. And then when the interest rates dropped as low as they did, I then refinanced them. So I was borrowing the money on the quadplex, it was at seven and on the duplex, it was at six and a half. And I just refinanced both of those down to 4%. Mm -hmm. And my question is, and I'm going to do the same thing on the two duplexes out of Palm Coast. I have a deal where I can get into both of those at 15% down. Mm Mm-hmm. So my thought is, is just, you know, hey, make the tenant do the work. If I can acquire an asset for 15% down, yes, I get a little bit less cash flow each month. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Oh, I think that's that's great. You know, the only thing you need to consider is uh, the cost of any mortgage insurance that might be required and the cost of any difference in interest rate and that or difference in points and points are just prepaid interest. So it's the same idea, but that might influence you to some extent. Of course, always we like as much leverage as possible, as little down as possible. But, you know, if you're paying a giant premium for that privilege, then you may you may want to think twice about it and put a little more down. It's only 5%. So, you know, occasionally I've seen to where, you know, even I will say, put that extra 5% down. Mm-hmm. Um, you just have to analyze the loan and, and the opportunity cost of that money. Uh, that's That's really it. That's kind of the plan that I'm going with is, uh, you know, put as little down as I can while I have the opportunity to do so. And if I need to 
like, as you say, you know, renegotiate the deal as I go along. Yeah. That's Isn't basically that beautiful. <laughs> It's amazing. And, and, oh, and the other thing I was talking to you about was my uh, primary home. You know, I bought in St. John's County in 2019, in July of 2019 for $460,000. And then at 3.75, so I put 20% down of 460 at 3.75, locked in for 30 years. I just refi, I did a cash out refi on that um, three weeks ago where they newly appraised my property at $530,000 and I got a 2.875 rate for 30 wow. years. <laughs> awesome. That is phenomenal. Here, we need sound effects for that. <laughs> that's how good it is. Yeah, that's, well, that, isn't that incredible? So just, I, you got a 30-year asset there on all of those properties. You know, acquire as many of those assets as you can. That's the thing to do. And I got to thank you for that because honestly, I feel like I'm just like doing black ops stuff behind the scenes. I'm listening to a podcast. I'm talking to Sarah on the West Coast and I'm like mm -hmm. pulling these strings and doing all this stuff. And the people that I, in my peer group or my neighbors and other people I'm talking about, they're just not, they're just really not doing what I'm yeah. doing. Well, you know what? You don't want everybody doing what you're doing because they all, they'll <laughs> make all the great property. So <laughs> there, there's enough real estate investors out there who get it. Don't worry about that. Uh, I'm sure but, there uh, are. but yeah, try to try to convince them and help them. But you know, some people just get it, some won't. Uh, and usually they won't in a conversation or a soundbite. They've got to be interested themselves. And um, they've got to not trust the current system we're all hypnotized with, which is the, you know, the 401k IRA BS, the Wall Street BS, you got to make your own way in the world. That's the, that's the only way to do it. And income property is the, is the best way to do that, as, as we both know, and probably everybody listening knows. So, uh, Bruce, this, uh, this is awesome. Thank you so much for sharing all of this. Anything else you want to share? It could be about anything, the lumber market, the construction market, your own story, uh, any questions uh, as we wrap it up? No, not really. I think I'm just going all chips in on the lumber industry. You know, I got to thank my friend Aaron Copelson. I'll tell you a quick story. We were standing on the beach with our surfboards. We were about to go surfing at Doheny Beach. And Aaron goes, hey, I'm going to fly out to Little Rock, Arkansas next week and uh, look at buying an investment property. And I had never really heard the idea of the philosophy at all. And I was like, what? And we're literally putting wax on the surfboard, feet in the sand, right. heading out to go surfing. And I just thought about it. He goes, yeah, man, I'm just going to buy a house and have a tenant pay off my debt. And I remember when he said that, I was like, that's a really good idea. <laughs> it is a good idea. I need to check that out. Yeah. And, uh, and then it was just kind of all downhill from there. And here we are. Yeah. Well, yeah, good stuff. Good stuff. That's, that's great to hear. And folks, just to elaborate on Bruce's point there, remember, I've said it before, but think about how significant this is. You know, a, a typical renter will spend 33, 40% of their monthly income on rent. So literally, you know, ab about 10 to 14 days per month, they're literally working for you. To pay off your mortgage. Isn't that like That's what great. other what other business, Bruce, is there where some customer spends that high a percentage of their income with this business? There is no yeah. other business. It's not Amazon, Zero. it's not Apple Computer, it's not you know, it's not going to Vegas and spending money in casinos, I hope, uh, not at least, you know, nowhere else do they spend as much money as they do is with their landlord. It's the big store. It's where they spend most of their money. So that's, that's, that's fantastic. Yeah. And I've been that guy. I was doing that out in uh, Dana Point, California. We could either rent where we wanted to live, which was a block off PCH in Dana Point and be able to go surfing and have a good time or own where we didn't want to live, which was right. out there in Riverside, your Belinda and you know where I'm yeah. talking about. Yeah, I definitely know where you're talking about. Um, yeah. And you know what, though? Renting that place in Dana Point probably wasn't a bad deal because the rent-to-value ratio was in your favor. <laughs> so, that's it. That's as it. long as you own other rental properties to compensate for that rent you pay. So that's, that's the point. Bruce, awesome. Thank you so much for sharing the story. We really appreciate it. And uh, thank you for your business, too. And uh, happy investing. Thanks again. You got it, Jason. Thanks for having me on.